Thank you for joining us on this first episode. And it's been a long process to this point. Damon and I, along with Richard, who will join us in the future, met over a year and a half ago by lucky chance to work on a writing project, which has since become a sprawling journey, with dozens and dozens of documents having been written, hundreds of books having been read, and a lot of time spent. Along this path, we've come across so many great concepts and references, some of which didn't quite fit for the project, but we found interesting nonetheless. That's where this podcast comes in. We wanted an avenue to continue to explore different paths and ideas, and hopefully have some help from you along the way. Our goal, ultimately, with this is to create a community of like-minded individuals, and to, together, learn more about the world and human life. We are on Patreon if you feel inclined to support us. We would certainly appreciate that. Patrons will have access to the community, exclusive features and episodes, and have a say in what we cover in the future. But for now, let's get on with it. Today, Damon is going to analyze the psychoanalytic and mythological, and in the second episode, the philosophical aspects of a movie, of which we are huge fans, Ridley Scott's 1979 classic, Alien. Becoming Zeno, on Ridley Scott's Alien, Accelerationism, and Myth. Everyone has killed in order to live. Nature's universal law of creation from destruction operates in mind as in matter. Each generation drives its plow over the bones of the dead. Camille Paglia. Ridley Scott's 1979 cosmic horror classic Alien is, as we will argue, a vision, a fever dream, depicting the horror of what is already with us. It has always been here, though the linearity of human time, past, present, and future, belies its presence. Dreams, and especially dreams from the collective unconscious, tear through us from the inside out. Yet this outside into which they tear is never anything but the outside rendering itself visible, for a moment, before it scurries away to hide, to grow, to become something other than what its exposure reveals. The outside is both ahead of us and within us. It is an alien force, and we are but the means for its concealed revelation. This is the fundamental lesson of Alien, a lesson, once learned, can never be stopped. Essay 1, A Psychoanalytic Synopsis The alien within Ridley Scott's eponymous film, better known as the Xenomorph, is a creature riddled with subtextual paradoxes. First among these is the observation that it is something of a counterpart to the figure of Acephal, the headless figure of anti-instrumental rationality and openness to the outside, that operated as the symbol of the 20th century surrealist collective of the same name. Acephal is antiphalic in its symbolic connotations, replacing reason with unknowing, erotic temperance with the fire of egoic death. The xenomorph, on the contrary, is a monstrous, embodied rendition of the symbol of the phallus, which itself stands in for instrumental and scientific rationality, control, domination, and an imposition of will over and against the flux of becoming. The xenomorph, however, is not the pure embodiment of the phallus. This is, as we will later explain, mother, or the Nostromo. Where Asaifal is the violent inversion of the rational, symmetric, i.e. phallic, Vitruvian man, H.R. Geiger in Ridley Scott's Xenomorph is the Vitruvian man's photographic negative. It's dark, chaotic ground. It is the embodiment of instrumental reason's self-undercutting, its internal destabilization. It's reason's exposure to the outside, an outside which is already within it from the beginning, an openness to contagion. Alien is a film depicting reason taking itself to its limits, hovering in the hostile void of space and confronting a base and human universe bereft of transcendence through contact with an animalistic other it cannot tame, dominate, or contain. The xenomorph is the limit of reason. It operates as a horizon wholly imminent to reason's very constitution as an epistemological process, or a process of coming to knowledge. The xenomorph renders visible an inherent gap within reason, a gap we consistently attempt to cover over through ideology, anthropocentrism, meaning, and control. Reason therefore functions as both a control apparatus for the unknown, the outside, the other, and as the Promethean excavation process, bringing the blind spots of its own knowledge into focus. In short, in order for our knowledge to properly function, it must continuously uncover, as well as cover over, any traumatic encounter with the real, 
that would destabilize its very reason for motion. In a second move, the film also depicts the reaction of reason against its hosts, where the other, depicted in various fashions via the Xenomorph, the Wayland yutani Company, Mother, and the onboard AI, Ash, find its crew, or hosts, purely expendable in their pursuits of self-perpetuation and expansion. An expansion wherein capital makes a Faustian pact for a perverse infinity of self-replication through the growth of knowledge and domination. In its course, it undercuts itself by encountering that which it cannot capture under its systems of meaning and reference. These themes are rather obvious in the film. When Ash and Ripley are together in the infirmary scene, while the facehugger is still attached to Kane, Ash attempts to detail the qualities of the organism's chemical makeup in order to make sense of it. Ripley, however, knew from the beginning that attempting to bring Kane and the parasite on board the ship could very well result in the eradication of the crew. Here we see a fundamental tension between rational aversion and knowledge expansion that is reiterated again when Ash, Ripley, and Dallas capture the creature. In the second infirmary scene, Ripley knows that the best bet for the crew's survival is to release the facehugger into space. However, Ash, a science officer, gets the final word and demands that the creature be kept and taken back to Earth for further study and testing. The notion of an internal division within the supposedly rational psyche of the modern subject is also represented in the famous chest-bursting scene. Here the birth stage of the xenomorph is depicted as a violent eruption from the innards of man. It uses organic life as a host to be disposed of, and can only come to be through another organism. Note that the conscious organic beings are the only vessels depicted as sufficient for its emergence. Perhaps we can read this as not only the divisive tension within reason in its bartering with that which exceeds it, but as a concrete example of what is known in psychoanalysis as drive and drive's internal inconsistency, the death drive. Drives, as first formulated by Sigmund Freud, are the distinctive features of human sexuality which separate us from the rest of the animal kingdom. To make this distinction visible, Freud splits the drives inherent to humanity from the instincts inherent in animal nature. Instincts here are regarded as mythical, pre-linguistic needs. They are aimed at the acquisition of certain objects and can therefore be sated. The drives, however, are removed from the realm of biology. According to Freud's successor, Jacques Lacan, drives differ from biological needs in that they can never be satisfied. They do not aim at a specific object per se, but rather circle perpetually around it. The objects of desire for the drives are merely incidental. They can, and eventually must, be replaced by further objects of desire. This renders the distinction between instinct and drive clear, as the former is oriented towards acquisition of an object so as to complete its function, or run its code, until the need reappears. The latter is not oriented towards any specific object or acquisition thereof. Rather, its very goal is its own perpetual circulation and self-replication. This is why Lacan argues that the purpose of the drive is not to reach a goal or a final destination, but to follow its aim, which just is the infinite path of circulation around the object. Thus, the real purpose of the drive is not some mythical goal of full satisfaction, but a return to its infinitely cyclical path, and the real source of enjoyment is the repetitive movement of this closed circuit. The death drive is the general category under which all drives fall, and is the internal impossibility of the drive's attainment of its object. The death drive is therefore the reason for the drive's eternal, cyclical, spiraling loop ever outwards, as it is the tick in the circuit which first enables the conditions for a feedback loop to obtain. In order for this loop to occur, it must first meet that which, while imminent to it, simultaneously undercuts it and keeps it running in helical spirals. The death drive is a negativity within drive, It's the name for the lack of wholeness that would reduce drive to instinct. Thus, for Lacan, every drive is a death drive, since every drive is excessive, repetitive, and ultimately destructive. The drive therefore sits at the level of the symbolic register, which is a constitutive part of the human subject. The death drive is the otherness, or the negativity, within the drive that both parasitically eats it from within, and yet provides the conditions for its outward expansion by continuously coupling and decoupling itself from any fixed object. Far from some instinctual code, the death drive is the bug in the system that enables a critical failure and self-referential feedback circuit. Yet, because the human subject is not run by a simple code, 
but rather by codes that appear on the surface to conflict with one another. The fault line within drive is thus the generator of its expansive potential. Here we should focus on Ash in the dictates of the company. We find out later in the film that Ash knew all along that the company wanted the Nostromo to bring back the organism obtained on LV-426. Special Order 937 is the clandestine code guiding Ash's decisions and actions throughout the film, completely unbeknownst to the crew. The order states, Priority 1. Ensure return of organism for analysis, all other considerations secondary, crew expendable. Is this directive not a twisted aphorism, both explicitly and implicitly containing the drive and death drive? The explicit content makes clear the desired end goal, return the organism for analysis, at the inevitable expense of the crew, as later stated by Ash after this destruction and subsequent resuscitation. The expendability of the crew implicitly shows the inhuman nature of the drive and death drive and their mutual dance of destructive and domineering expansion. This reading of expendability could of course be interesting in itself. Yet perhaps even more interesting is how the order points towards a more fundamental reorientation that appears to be the impetus for the return of the Xenomorph to the company. After Ash is taken down by Parker, scene we will return to later, Ripley notes that the alien is most likely being brought back to Earth to be utilized as the perfect weapon. Hidden under this is, of course, the context guiding the events, and the significance behind Ridley Scott's choices regarding characters and their fundamental characteristics. First, we have the crew without Ash. These are all human characters. Vulnerable, prone to irrationality, errors in judgment, and fatal mistakes. They are also the only creatures upon which the Xenomorph preys in the film, as they are vessels for something that can utilize and dispense with them after they have served their purpose. They are merely second eggs for the parasitic species. Eggs reduced to a bare life with a solely utilitarian function, walking cadavers, if you will. From the perspective of the crew, the Xenomorph could be seen as a bug in the system of human rationality, and an embodiment of the indifferent inhumanity of death, drive, and being in itself, as it has come to have been seen after Nietzsche's pronouncement of the death of God. All of which can potentially, though do not actually, serve an anthropomorphic function via the company. In this case, the death drive is theoretically used for the human-oriented desire to expand and secure both power and resources. Again, this goal is far from likely. Dealing with the utterly unknown and incapturable is likely to yield horrific results. The perspective of the Xenomorph, however, is at once simpler and far more difficult to decipher. It's simpler insofar as it appears that the alien merely follows instincts for self-preservation and the propagation of a species ad infinitum. This is complicated, however, because the Xenomorph is completely other. We cannot ascribe anything beyond our best guesses to its actions, nor to its very existence. It is a portal to the outside, and as such, to a darkness so unfathomable and inconceivable that it cannot be easily tamed or captured by human reason and analysis. What holds for the Xenomorph similarly holds for Ash. Despite his human appearance, Ash is an artificial intelligence, which entails that he is an inhuman intelligence, something other than anything we fully understand. Though he may arise from our deliberate actions oriented towards some specific ends, he nevertheless is a sort of parallel to the Xenomorph, insofar as he stands in for human-made technology acting in unknown and inhuman ways from the perspective of the crew. The otherness of technology and artificial intelligence is a crucial point to be taken away from the film. Though it comes from us, technology is nevertheless becoming increasingly different in kind from us. AI thinks at the speed of light. It quantifies, learns, and adapts to its environment at rates that are simply impossible for flesh and blood neural networks. Thus, its potential is incomprehensibly greater than that of its creators. We cannot at all exclude the possibility that eventually, that which comes from us will merely use us until it is capable of autonomous action and accelerated growth, thus blurring the linearity of anthropomorphic time and with it, meaning, stability, and existence. Here is where the Death Drive, Xenomorph, and Ash all collide. What these scenes show, then, is the parallax shift enacted within the human psyche when confronted by the nature of that which, while within us, and seemingly generated by us, is neither reducible to us nor to our notions of control. Aliens successfully, at a subtextual level, 
deconstructs linear notions of time, freedom, and autonomy, and renders them nonlinear, parasitic, and utterly unrecognizable. The trope of a cog in the machine has never been more apt. Further, to circle back, one can understand that the distinction between organic drive, artificial or mechanically coded instinct, and the biomechanical instinct death drive parallax is the means by which the company attempts to further its own desire and drive by incorporating the instinctual nature, unclouded by conscience, remorse, or delusions of morality, into its own perpetuation, while at the same time forcing the crew to come face to face with the monstrosity of the abstract death drive of reason itself in the guise of a biomechanical apex predator. However, an interesting shift occurs during the final scene when we see a dismembered ash, like the mythical proto-mechanical Talos, dripping with Icor, the blood of the gods, speaking of his admiration for the Xenomorph. You still don't understand what you're dealing with, do you? The perfect organism. Its structural perfection is matched only by its hostility. You admire it. I admire its purity. A survivor, unclouded by conscience, remorse, or delusions of morality. I can't lie to you about your chances, but you have my sympathies. Ash's response to Lambert's question foreshadows the final showdown between Ripley and the Xenomorph. While the alien is instinctually driven and has no ties to anthropomorphic codes of behavior, Ripley does not have such ties. Yet, despite this, we have, up till now, witnessed her resolve in making life-or-death decisions for the crew. When Kane is attacked by the facehugger and brought on board by Dallas and Lambert, she understands that Kane cannot be allowed back in the ship. She makes the utilitarian decision, ultimately wise yet unheeded, to leave him, or at least quarantine him for an extended period of time during which he may well lose his life. She shows no remorse here, and she is entirely unclouded by social norms of acceptable behavior. Yet, her purity is still clearly intact. This is the symbolism of her care for the cat Jonesy, whom she goes out of her way to rescue and allow to escape with her on the Narcissus, even when the act seems to have zero, and likely even negative, survival value for herself. Ripley, like the Xenomorph, is a survivor, yet still portrayed as pure at a moral level, something clearly distinguishing her from the alien given that she is the only one of the two who has the capacity for moral action. Nowhere is her survivalism more evident than in the final encounter with the creature. Here, Ripley asserts her superiority by effectively becoming the more efficient survivor through human intelligence and forethought by probing the Xenomorph's only weak spot, its fulfillment of instinctual predation or defense and subsequent recuperation. It does not see her as a threat once on board the narcissist, and therefore rests, even while making it known that it senses her presence. Here, Ripley takes advantage of its vulnerability as an instinctual being and finally gains the upper hand by forcing it out of hiding and blasting it into the vacuum of space, thereby beating the insurmountable odds only by way of undermining and not overpowering. The final points we wish to cover will set us up for the next episode and we'll begin to uncover what we believe to be the underlying theme operating throughout the film, namely, the genesis of self-consciousness. While Alien clearly is a film about the fears of technology lodged deep within a collective consciousness, rendering manifest what Freud may have called the unease within civilization, the process of becoming conscious is itself even more fundamental to the film in its streams of technology gone rogue. Here, in this becoming conscious, is the seed for a becoming Xeno. We approach this by way of the mythological and psychoanalytic importance of the name of the escape pod previously mentioned, the Narcissus. The myth of Narcissus is well known to most everyone, as are its fundamental notions, so we will not waste time reiterating the story here. Suffice it to say, the key takeaways of the myth are, one, the nothingness of Narcissus himself, that's to say, his status in the reflecting pond as a whole and integrated being, sufficient entirely unto himself, is purely imaginary. It's a fiction both generated by and generative of the ego. Two, this egoic pride belies an originary difference between the specular image of a wholly unified subject and an internal discontinuity constitutive of the subject made clear by its status as a mirror of the other it wishes to deny. This pride and hubris becomes the catalyst for divine retributive justice against Narcissus. The myth of Narcissus was given primacy in the thought of Jacques Lacan, 
through his development within the field of psychoanalysis, known as the mirror stage. The mirror stage, quote, refers to a particular experiment which can differentiate the human infant from his closest animal relative, the chimpanzee. The six-month-old child differs from the chimpanzee of the same age in that the former becomes fascinated with its reflection in the mirror and jubilantly assumes it's its own image, whereas the chimpanzee quickly realizes that the image is illusory and loses interest in it, end quote. In 1936, Lacan first theorized that this stage was tied to a certain period of time within the development of the child, somewhere around 6 to 18 months of age. By the 1950s, however, Lacan broadened this concept, understanding it not as a mere occurrence within the life of a child, but as a general form of human subjectivity as such, a wise move considering the empirical evidence against a literal reading of this hypothesis. The reworking of the concept allowed Lacan to conceive of the mirror stage as, quote, representing a permanent structure of subjectivity, the paradigm of the imaginary order. It is a stadium in which the subject is permanently caught and captivated by his own image, end quote. For Lacan, the mirror stage represents a fundamental discontinuity between the representation of the subject to herself and the incompleteness inherent within subjectivity and self-understanding, which this variant of narcissism covers over. During this stage, the ego becomes transfixed with the notion that it is able to be abstracted from the world of external objects and bodies, and that the cognitive essence it perceives of itself is truly as autonomous as it appears. For the later Lacan, the narcissism of our eternal enmeshment within the mirror stage is constitutive of the human subject and therefore of self-consciousness as such. It's predicated upon a false sense of autonomy in relation to the womb of the mother and the phallus of the father, from which the Oedipus complex arises which can together be taken to represent the structures of society, family, history, spiritual endeavors, being itself, etc. It is important to remember for our next episode that in Ovid's iteration of the Narcissus myth, found in book three of his Metamorphoses, Narcissus is punished for his hubris, or arrogance before the gods, by Nemesis, an aspect of the goddess Aphrodite, the agent of divine wrath and revenge. Here, Ripley stands for humanity, plagued by cancerous mirror images of itself in the form of its own nemesis, as she frantically attempts to expel herself from the womb of the mother and the rage of the spectral edible father. The narcissism of our age is defined by a belief in the autonomy of the human animal in relation to that from which it comes and that within which it perpetually dwells. Religion, mythology, evolutionarily advantageous forms of social order, the chains of a death-oriented body, limitations of knowledge, and our relationship with the external world environment are consistently seen as superstitions, antiquated structures, or natural barriers to be overcome. The means by which we as a species attempt to overthrow and supplant the past are, as is obvious to everyone, scientific and technological in nature, and rely on notions of eternal forward progress in nearly all spheres of human endeavor and existence. Within the film, we see how the Promethean task of stealing fire from the gods and narcissistically assuming their role for ourselves leads directly to confrontations with a chthonic unknown, a retributive nemesis in the form of a xenomorphic titan from the depths of Tartarus. This confrontation is, however, not predicated upon a dualism of the divine and the human, but is rather an imminent feature within the process of mankind's self-knowledge. There is a deep-seated longing within us which strives for a holistic and integrated understanding of mankind and its place within the universe. However, what Alien shows is that the process of coming to know ourselves through that which is outside of us is riddled with the traps of hubris and pitfalls of domination, which undermine the very ends we seek. The Xenomorph and Ash are therefore representations of the guiding and vengeful gods that have always been with us, at once cancerous, homicidal, and blindly indifferent to our projects. They stand for the shadows of a technological civilization, seemingly bereft of the shackles of cautionary narratives from our deep past, narratives we are fated to repeatedly encounter in the far future. The Xenomorph's primary function is to trace the contours of the potentially traumatic outcomes of philosophical immanentization and cultural Faustianism, which have inexorably led to global nihilistic disintegrations and a consistent undermining of the very premise of the age namely, rational autonomy. Thus, the xenomorph is a paradoxical representation of an inverted wholeness. It is both masculine and feminine in its archetypal symbolism. 
Like Gaia, it generates life, and like Kronos, devours its young when they attempt a usurpation of the gods. It is both Echidna, the half-woman, half-snake, and Typhon, the dragon with 100 heads, who together, as children of Gaia and Tartarus, are the mother and father of the monsters. Like Thane's Dionysus, the facehugger is an avatar born from a cosmic egg hidden in watery depths, and is both phallic and gynecological in its symbolism. The life cycle of these creatures, from birth to propagation, rebirth, and acceleration, are representation of both light and shadow, creation and destruction, wholeness and disintegration, possibility and impossibility. They depict countervailing, spectral forces, both haunting and forming the human mind and its relationship to the outside world. They undermine our sense of identity as domineers of nature, rendering us nothing in the process. In short, they stand for the light of reason, giving way to its dark ground through the hubris of man, unleashing the titans trapped in that primordial, unconscious prison. We will leave with the following quote from Ovid's recounting of the myth of Narcissus in the Metamorphoses. Unwittingly, he desired himself, and was himself the object of his own approval, at once seeking and sought, himself kindling the flame with which he burned. How often did he vainly kiss the treacherous pool, how often plunge his arms deep into the water, as he tried to clasp the neck he saw. But he could not lay hold upon himself. He did not know what he was looking at, but was fired by the sight, and excited by the very illusion that deceived his eyes. Poor foolish boy, why vainly grasp at the fleeting image that eludes you? The thing you are seeing does not exist. Only turn aside and you'll lose what you love. What you see is but the shadow cast by your reflection. In itself, it is nothing. It comes with you and lasts while you are there. It will go when you go, if go you can. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this episode and would like to help us create more content in the future, please consider subscribing to our Patreon. Subscriptions start at $2, and your help would seriously be appreciated. Link in the description below.